I'm excited to get on to the main part here. I want to introduce our keynote speaker today, Sarah Robinson. Uh, we had a little back and forth um, on email, and so a little bit of Sarah's background. She moved to San Francisco to work as a startup incubator doing marketing and research after college and wasn't uh, fully thrilled by that, so she taught herself to code uh, you know, in San Francisco, not realizing how many other developers there were quite in San Francisco, but had a lot of fun doing that. Ended up um, getting hired at Firebase in 2013. She was employee number seven of Firebase, so has been doing, doing that for, for a long time. Google bought Firebase in 2014, so then she became a member of the Google developer um, ecosystem. I'll just wave some hands through that. Um, so kind of some cool things about her job. Uh, you should definitely follow her on Twitter, S Rob tweets, S Rob tweets. Um, traveling all over the world, there's uh, often doing talks on Google Cloud products. Uh, one of my favorite was when uh, you guys went to overseas and the Petra uh, stones. Anyway, that was pretty cool. Um, so travels the world advocating for Google uh, Cloud tools. One highlight, she said, was built a Swift app that would tell you whether or not Taylor Swift was in the image that you submitted. <laughs> um, so I also ask, you know, what, what would it take, what would be your day job if money were really not an issue? And she said, and I'm going to quote her, she's super lucky to have a job where she can write code and travel the world teaching developers about the cloud. And she, honestly, there's no other job she'd rather have. So I feel that we are super lucky to have Sarah here today to give our keynote. So thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Can everyone hear? It's on. Very cool. Thanks. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Zero to ML on GCP. Um, I'm super excited to be here. This is my third year at DevFest I'm in. I love coming to Minneapolis, even though it is really cold. Um, as Lloyd mentioned, my name is Sarah Robinson. Uh, I'm a developer advocate on the Google Cloud Platform team based in New York. And for those of you that don't know what a developer advocate is, um, my job is to teach other developers in the community, like all of you, how to use different Google Cloud Platform products and I focus specifically on machine learning. Um, so my job day to day involves a combination of writing code, building demos, um, to show people what you can do with different Google Cloud Platform products, as well as traveling, giving talks at events like this, um, and writing online content like blog posts and video tutorials. You can find me on Twitter at srobtweets. Um, so the goal of this presentation is that by the end of it, whether you have no machine learning experience or you're a super experienced machine learning practitioner, you'll know some ways that you can get started adding machine learning to your own applications. Um, just a quick show of hands, I'm curious, how many of you are, are already using machine learning um, in your business or on, on a side project? Looks like not too many, so hopefully by the end of this, um, you'll all have some tools that you can use to get started. And you can find me on Twitter at srobtweets. So I wanna start out by talking about, at a high level, what is machine learning? So machine learning is teaching computers to recognize patterns in the same way that our brains do. And the idea is that over time, um, as machine learning models are given more and more data, they'll improve and they'll be able to generalize on examples that they haven't seen before. So does anybody remember how they learned their first spoken language? Um, so your parents probably didn't give you a dictionary and a bunch of grammar books, that'd be kind of weird. Uh, instead, you learned over time by being exposed to many different examples. Um, so let's say the first time you had pasta for dinner, probably saw it on your plate, you heard your parents identify it, and over time that strengthened certain pathways in your brain. Um, so maybe you misidentified it one time, and then you were able to identify it correctly. Um, and that repetition is roughly how machine learning works too. So to summarize, uh, machine learning is loosely based on how the human brain learns. Um, instead of neurons in your brain, we have mathematical neurons um, that mimic the way that our brain works. Machine learning lets us solve problems without knowing exactly what the solution might be. We can let the model do a lot of the work for us. And finally, it enables systems that improve over time as they're given more and more data. So we can think of almost any machine learning problem in this way. Um, so you have some sort of input, 
Um, this input might be labeled. That's called supervised learning, and that's what I'm gonna focus on today. So we have some inputs. We feed it into a model, and then we get a prediction. Now how much you know about how that model works is kind of up to you. I'm gonna show you a, different, a spectrum of different products um, to help you integrate machine learning. So this was an overview of machine learning at a high level, um, but how do we actually get from this input to a prediction, and what types of inputs might we, might we be dealing with? So one example is our input might be an image. So it might be the pixels in this image, and the output might be the label cat. We wanna know that there's a cat in this image. Or maybe we wanna go one step further, and we wanna identify the bounding box of where that cat is in the image. So that could be one type of machine learning problem. Another example could be text input. So let's say the text is the headline of this article, and the prediction we wanna generate is the label sports. Or maybe we wanna get more specific um, and extract the label baseball. Or what if we wanna build a custom model um, that's able to predict which news publication this headline came from? Another type of input could be a video, and the prediction could be labels of what's happening in each frame of that video. So many people see the term machine learning, um, and they get a little bit scared. They immediately think it's something only for experts. And if we quickly take a look back roughly 60 years ago, this was definitely the case. So this is a picture of the first neural network called the Perceptron. Um, it was invented in 1957 by Frank Rosenblatt, and it demonstrated an ability to identify shapes. So back then, if you wanted to work on machine learning, you needed access to extensive academic and computing resources. But if we fast forward to today, we can see that just in the last six years, uh, the number of projects at Google that are using machine learning has grown dramatically. Here's just a couple of the products at Google that you may recognize uh, that are using machine learning models under the hood. But at Google, we don't think machine learning should be something just for experts. So we wanna give machine learning, uh, make it accessible to any developer or data scientist with a computer and a machine learning problem that you wanna solve. So to start thinking about how you might use machine learning in your applications, you wanna think about the type of machine learning problem you're solving. So are you solving a generic task um, that someone else has already solved before? Or is the prediction task you wanna solve more custom um, and very specific to your data set? So if we look at an example with image classification, let's say we wanna label this as a picture of a cat. Um, as you probably know, this has been done many, many times before, so there's no need to really start from scratch and build a model trained on your own data. But let's say that this cat's name is Bob, and you wanna identify Bob in, across your entire photo library. Um, and you also wanna identify where his face is in the image. So this is gonna be a more custom task that you're probably gonna need to train on your own data. If we take natural language processing as an, as an example, um, here's a tweet I posted. And let's say that I wanna do some natural language processing on it to extract the parts of speech from this sentence. This is a pretty common natural language processing task. So there's already a lot of models that exist to do this. So I don't need to start from scratch. Um, but let's say that I wanna label this tweet as a tweet about programming or Google Cloud. I'm gonna need to train that on a lot of tweets to be able to produce those very specific labels. So I'm gonna show you in this talk how we can go from zero to machine learning using a couple of different tools. And I'm gonna start by talking about our machine learning APIs that we offer on Google Cloud Platform. Um, these are APIs that give you access to a pre-trained machine learning model without requiring you to know anything about how that model works under the hood. Then I'm gonna talk about a new product um, that we launched just a couple of weeks ago called AutoML, which lets you customize these APIs with your own data and then finally, I'm gonna talk about how you can build a custom model um, from scratch trained on your own data using TensorFlow and Cloud Machine Learning Engine. Um, so if we think of these in terms of what type of people these products are targeting, on the left-hand side, um, these products are catered more to app developers that wanna integrate machine learning into their applications but might not have so much background in machine learning. And then if we go to this side, to the right side, um, these are focused more, uh, targeted more towards data scientists and machine learning practitioners. Um, but I, what I wanna show you is that when we get to the end of the presentation, you'll see that even um, using TensorFlow, there's a way to build a TensorFlow model um, without having much machine learning experience. 
So when I'm starting to solve a machine learning problem, before I choose what tool I'm going to use, I like to think of it in terms of what resources I'm going to need to solve that problem. So these are just a few. Uh, there's probably more that I haven't listed here. Um, the first is training data. Are you going to need to have any of your own training data, and how much training data will you need? How much of the model code and the model architecture are you going to have to write on your own? Um, how much training and serving infrastructure will you need to provision? Um, how much code will you need to write the prediction? And then finally, um, how much time will this entire project take? So just so we can think of this uh, in terms of all the products I'm going to be covering, it's going to be a whirlwind. I'm going to try to cover all these products in less than 45 minutes. Um, we've got our machine learning APIs as a great way to get started. Very little prediction code required. Again, they're just REST APIs. And you could probably get up and running with these in less than a day. If we look at AutoML, um, you'll need some of your own training data here because you're going to be able to customize these APIs using your own data. Um, and it's going to take a little more time because you'll need to pre-process your data, um, making sure that it's labeled correctly. And I'm going to talk about two ways to build a custom model. The first is transfer learning, um, which I'll talk about a bit more later on. Um, but quickly, it lets you use, utilize a pre-trained model um, and then fine-tune it with your own data. So you're going to need more training data for this. You'll have to write some of the model code yourself. Um, the training and serving infrastructure is up to you whether you want to run it on-premise or use a managed service like we offer on Google Cloud. Um, you'll need a little bit more prediction code and a bit more time. And then finally, we have um, building a custom model from scratch, which is going to take um, a bit more of all of these resources. So I'm going to give you an introduction to all of them. And I want to start with machine learning APIs. So as I mentioned, these let you use a pre-trained model with a single REST API request. We've got five different APIs on Google Cloud Platform to let you do this. Um, Cloud Vision API lets you analyze images. Video Intelligence API lets you analyze what's happening in every frame of your videos. Um, Cloud Speech lets you implement functionality similar to OK Google into your own applications. The Natural Language API is great for natural language processing. And then finally, we offer Cloud Translation um, if you want to implement functionality similar to uh, Google Translate into your own applications. So we've got a lot of APIs here. Um, I'm going to cover just two of them. And I'll give you an overview of what they do, and we'll dive into some demos. So the Vision API lets you do all of these things. Um, starting at the top left, it lets you do label detection, which is essentially going to tell you what is this a picture of. So for this photo, it might return elephant, animal, et cetera. Web detection uh, will let you search the web for additional details on your image. Um, so it'll look for visually similar images across the web. And based on the content of those pages, it'll be able to extract more data on what's in your image. OCR stands for optical character recognition. And this will let you extract text from images. Um, and it'll tell you the language of that text. So if anyone's ever used the Google Translate app, I use it all the time when I travel. If you take a picture of a sign in a foreign language, and it provides a translation for you, you can use Vision API's OCR uh, to implement similar functionality. Logo detection is pretty self-explanatory. It tells you, is there a company logo in this image? Uh, landmark detection will tell you if there's a common landmark in the image. Crop hints will help you uh, crop your photos to focus on a specific subject. And then finally, explicit content detection will tell you, um, is this image appropriate or not? And this one's really useful for basically any site with user-generated content. If you've got users uploading images, rather than having somebody on the other end manually reviewing them, you can just do one API call, um, and then you only have to review a subset of your images. Uh, so one company that's using this in production is Giphy. Uh, and they're using the OCR, the Optical Character Recognition feature. Um, for those of you that don't know Giphy, it's a website to let you search for GIFs and share them across the internet. And um, before they started using the Vision API, they weren't um, searching by text in GIFs. So many of you know that there's lots of text in GIFs. And um, in just a couple of days, they added Vision API to improve their search so that now when you search on Giphy, um, you can actually search by the text in an image. And they noticed um, improved accuracy on their search results by doing this. So they wrote a great blog post about it if you want to learn more on uh, engineering.giphy.com. Um, now, I don't like to dive too far into a talk without a live demo. Um, so I'm going to show you a live demo of the Vision API. Um, so what I have here is the Vision API products page. And on the product pages for all of our APIs, um, you can try them directly in the browser. So here I can upload an image. 
And I'm gonna upload this picture of Minneapolis. I didn't take it, but found it on the internet. Um, and you can see that it's able to identify the landmark here, Stone Arch Bridge. Um, it gives us some labels on what's in the image. Uh, we also get some labels returned from web detection. And it tells us where this image is, can be found across the internet. Um, and we get the URL to all, all the places where this image can be found. We get properties like dominant colors in an image. Um, Safe search tells us if the image is appropriate or not. And then finally, we can inspect the JSON to see um, what the raw API response looks like. So I'm just gonna show you one more image to show you um, the face detection feature that we offer. This is a selfie that I took a couple of months ago on vacation. And when it goes through, we should be able to see face detection response come back. There we go. Um, so it can actually tell when you pass it an image with people in it, it can tell where the faces are in the image. Um, it can detect different emotions, so joy is likely in this image. Um, it can also detect sorrow, anger, surprise, if the person's wearing a hat or not. It tells us where different features are in the face as well. Um, and then we also get back the other types of detection that you just saw. Um, so the Vision API is 70% sure that I'm cool. Not sure what to make of that. Um, we get some other, other labels here. I was on vacation, so I was right about that. Um, so that's a demo of the Vision API. I really encourage you to try it out. Um, if you aren't sure if the Vision API is right for you, you can upload some images before you start writing any code to see if it's a good fit. So that was the Vision API. Um, just to show you how easy it is to make a request to the Vision API, again, you can do this in any language, it's just a basic REST API. We have a number of client libraries, so it makes it easy for you to access in your favorite language. Um, I use Node a lot for my demos, so I'm just showing a Node example here. Um, so I'm using the Google Cloud Node client library, creating a reference to the Vision object, telling it the types of detection I want to run. Then I just call detect, and I get all my image data back. So the next API I want to highlight is the Natural Language API. And the Natural Language API helps you analyze text in a couple of different ways. Um, first, you can extract key entities from your text. You can detect sentiment, whether the text is positive or negative. If you want to get a little bit more into the linguistic details of your text, you can analyze syntax. Um, and the newest feature of this API is content classification. So this will classify your text. We have um, just over 700 different categories available for that. So first I'll show you uh, analyzing syntax. And we'll do that using this sentence. Um, the natural language API helps us understand text. And we get a bunch of different data points back from um, the syntax analysis endpoint. So I've created a visualization to help you understand what they mean. So the first thing we get back is called a dependency parse tree. Um, and this tells us how different words in a sentence relate to each other. Then we get back the parse label, which tells us the role of each word in the sentence. So here we can see that root is, or that helps is the root verb. Um, API is the nominal subject. We get the part of speech. So this will tell us if it's a noun, a verb, a pronoun, et cetera. We get the lemma, um, and this is the canonical form of the word. So we, we see here we only get one back for helps. The lemma is help. So you would use this if you want to see how many times um, a specific word's being used to describe something in your application. You probably don't want to count each um, helps and help as two separate words. You just want to get the canonical form of the word. And then finally, we get additional morphology details on our text. And this is going to vary based on the language that we send our text to the API in. And the API supports um, a number of different languages. You can see a list in the documentation. So that's syntax analysis. Um, the next method I want to highlight is content classification. So what I did was I took the headline from this article and the first sentence, and I sent it to the content classification endpoint. And what I get back is it's given this text a category of baseball um, with 99% confidence, which is pretty cool considering the word baseball isn't actually mentioned anywhere in the text. Um, and I mentioned before, we have just over 700 different categories available. So you can get more than one category for um, one block of text. It'll give you just different confidence values for each one. So I also want to show you a demo of the Natural Language API. Um, similar to what I showed with the Vision API, on the product page, um, you can actually try it out right here in the browser. So I'm going to type a new sentence here. I'm going to say, I love DevFest MN, but the weather is freezing, which is true. I actually like the cold, but we'll see what this, the API responds for this. Um, so here what we get is the API will actually give us entity-based sentiment. 
So it'll, give it, it'll break down the sentiment, not only for the entire sentence, but for each entity in it. Um, and sentiment is a value ranging from negative one to one, showing you how positive or negative this text is. So we can see here for DevFest MN, it got a score of 0.8, so almost fully positive, um, whereas the weather, didn't like that too much, got a score of negative one. So this is really useful to help break down um, how, what people thought of different entities in a, maybe like a restaurant review or something like that. So if we look over here at sentiment, um, this actually isn't too useful to us because it's just the aggregate sentiment. What was more useful is um, the entity level sentiment, which I just showed. We get a visualization of the syntax analysis. Um, and then there's no categories for this because it's, it's too short. Um, you need at least 20 words. But if you want to try out the um, content classification feature, you can also um, do that in the browser right here. So I'll share the link to this demo at the end of the presentation. Um, so that is the natural language API. And uh, it's really easy to call the API. Here's another example in Node.js. Um, you can also pass the API a text file that's stored in Google Cloud Storage. And here we're just calling annotate on that language object, and we get all of our natural language data back. Um, so just to recap, you can use these pre-trained APIs if you've got a machine learning task you want to solve that fits into one of these categories. Um, now, a lot of times when I present on these APIs, I get the question, um, the APIs are great, but they don't quite fit the specific use case that I have. Um, so what if you want to train these APIs on your own custom data? Um, I'm super excited about a product we launched just a few weeks ago, um, AutoML. It's currently in alpha. I put two asterisks there, because um, right now it's whitelist only. Um, and right now it's available just for vision, so for image analysis. And AutoML lets you use your own data to customize a pre-trained API. I'm going to dive right into a demo to show you how AutoML Vision works. Um, so for this demo, let's pretend that I'm a meteorologist. Uh, maybe I work at a company like the Weather Channel. And I want to predict weather trends and flight plans from images of clouds. So this begs the question, can we use the cloud to analyze clouds? The answer is yes, as you probably guessed. Um, so as I was getting started with this demo, I discovered that there's over 10 different types of clouds. And they all indicate different weather patterns. Um, so my first thought for this demo was to try the Vision API. So what I did was I took all of these different types of cloud images that you see here. I sent them to the Vision API. Um, but what I noticed was that I got basically the same response back for all of them, even if they look completely different. So I got like sky, cloud, daytime, things like that for every image there. Now that's OK, though. We wouldn't expect the Vision API to be able to know which type of cloud this was. Um, so this is where AutoML Vision comes to the rescue. So with AutoML Vision, I was able to take my photo data set. I collected a lot of images of clouds, mostly sourced from my teammates. Um, and then I put them into AutoML Vision. Now what AutoML Vision is is essentially a UI that helps you um, label your data, train your model, deploy it, and serve it in production. I'm going to show you what it looks like in a moment. So once your model is trained, it's immediately available on Google Cloud Platform. And you can easily generate predictions with a REST API. So I'm going to go to a demo. And I'm going to show you the AutoML UI. Um, so here we are in the AutoML UI. Make that a little bit bigger so you can all see. There we go. Um, so it kind of takes you through each step of the process of training a model. So the first step here is importing your data. Um, and so you can import your data. Um, if you've got photos locally on your machine, you can just upload them directly here in the UI. Um, what I did is I put all of my training images in Google Cloud Storage. And then I created a CSV file with uh, the URL of my image and then the associated label for that image. So I've already imported the data. Then I would go over here to the labeling step. And um, one cool thing about AutoML is that let's say your data is not labeled. Um, you can use a human labeling service. So you pass your images. Um, you can let our in-house human labelers return you back a labeled data set for you. So maybe you don't have time to label your data. You can use the human labeling service. Um, in this example, I already labeled the data. Um, I didn't do this myself, actually. I'm not an expert on the actual clouds. Um, but I did find that we have a meteorologist at Google, and because uh, why not? And <laughs> so he helped me label these images for me, which was pretty awesome. Um, so here I can look through my images and make sure they're labeled correctly. So for example, I can look at all my cumulus clouds, see if there's any images incorrectly labeled here. Um, I can click on them, 
And if it's, if it's not the right label, I can change it out right here. Um, so I can look at, you know, a number of different labels here, see what my training data looks like. Um, and then I can also look at my label statistics. So I can see how many images I have for each label. Um, now, AutoML recommends at least 100 images to start to get a high uh, accuracy model. But you only need 10 if you want to get started just experimenting with it and start training. Um, so we can see here that I don't have quite enough images of each cloud type um, to produce a super high quality model, but it's just a demo. So I'll show you the next step. So the next step would be training my model. Um, and all I need to do here, I've already trained this, but all I need to do is press this train button and I'm ready to go. I'll get an email when training completes. So once my model's trained, um, the next thing I want to do is evaluate the accuracy of my model. And so here we can look at a couple of different metrics to see how our model performed. Um, notice here I mentioned I didn't have quite enough data to um, do high quality accuracy analysis um, to get tests for each of the 10 different labels I have. So we get a bunch of different graphs here. I'm not going to highlight all of them, um, but I do want to talk briefly about this table. Um, if it looks confusing, it's called a confusion matrix. So um, <laughs> essentially what you want to see here is you want to see um, a diagonal from the top left that is a perfect model would be all 100%. So what this is saying is that um, for all of my photos that were actually serious clouds, my model labeled 89% of the test images correctly. So this helps me see where I'm kind of lacking training data. And we see a lot of zeros here in cases where I didn't have enough data to, to test it on my model. Um, but what we notice here is that for my zero stratus, my zero stratus cloud images, 75% um, of them are being labeled incorrectly. So this is a good place for me to go and say, okay, I, need, I probably need to add more um, accurate images of those types of clouds. So looking at these metrics, we can kind of go in and see where we want to improve the training data in our model. So that's the evaluate step. Um, and then finally, the most important part is generating a prediction. So once our model's been trained, uh, we want to give it data that it hasn't seen before and see how it performs on that data. So I've got a couple um, example cloud images here. And remember that these images weren't used to train my model. Um, so it should be able to generalize. And we see here we get a prediction. So this, this image wasn't included in my training set. My model is able to predict with 99% confidence that this is a serious cloud, which is correct. Um, so we probably, the UI, it's useful to generate a prediction from the UI, but if you've trained a model, you probably want to build an application um, that queries your trained model. So there's a couple different ways to do that. Um, you can do it from the command line using G Cloud, which is our command line interface for interacting with a number of different Google Cloud Platform products. Um, you can use the Cloud ML Engine API. Um, what I want to highlight here is the Vision API. So if any of you have used the Cloud Vision API before, you'll notice that the request here doesn't look too much different from what you're used to. You just need to add a couple different things. So notice we added this uh, custom label detection field. And then we also want to point it to the ID of that model that we just trained. So you get access to this custom API that's, that's been specifically trained on your own data. Now just to show you how easy it is to build an application um, that queries this model, I built um, a simple Firebase web app. I like to use Firebase in a lot of my demos. And here I'm going to upload a photo of clouds and it's going to query my model and hopefully give me some data on this type of cloud. There we go. Um, so it's 97% confident that this is a cumulonimbus cloud. Um, if you see this cloud while you're flying, probably not a good sign. Might mean that there's turbulence ahead. Um, but this is just uh, an app I built to show you how I use the Vision API to uh, query this pre-trained, mo this custom model that I was able to um, build with AutoML Vision. So that is a demo of AutoML Vision. I'm gonna go back to the slides. And I wanna talk about a couple of companies that have been part of the alpha um, using AutoML Vision and giving us feedback on it. So one of the companies is Disney, and um, they use AutoML to build a custom model to improve their product search. So they trained a model on different Disney characters, product categories, um, things that the regular Vision API wouldn't have been able to identify in images. And they're being integrated into their search engine. Urban Outfitters uh, is a clothing company, and they had a similar use case to Disney, um, they also built a model to improve their search results. And they trained a model on specific product characteristics like patterns and neckline styles. Um, and they used that to create a comprehensive set of product attributes to improve search on the Urban Outfitters website. 
Um, and then the last use case I want to talk about is the Zoological Society of London. And they have a bunch of cameras deployed in the wild all over the place. Um, and instead of having someone manually review the images that come through these cameras, they've actually trained a model to be able to recognize different types of wildlife. So now they're able um, to use this instead of having someone manually review the images from all of those cameras. So that's an overview of AutoML vision. Um, so moving along, um, what if you've got a custom prediction task that doesn't fit um, AutoML vision or one of the APIs that's very specific to your data set or use case? So let's take a look at what, uh, what types of prediction tasks this might be. So let's say we want to do some custom text classification. Um, let's say we've got Stack Overflow posts or something similar type of data coming in, and we want a way to automatically tag these. So we're going to tag the first one as a question about JavaScript, for example. We're going to need to build a custom model trained on our own data to do that. Let's say we've got demographic data, um, and we want to predict which way a county or state will vote in a future election. So we've got numerical data like this, and we want to predict um, which way they, the county will vote. Another example is, let's say we want to identify where an object is in an image. Um, so let's say I've got this picture myself. I want to identify that it's me and where my face is in the image. Let's say I want to build some sort of like home security camera so it only lets me in the door. Um, so I would need to train a model only on pictures of myself. So in this case, you'll want to roll your own model. So you'll want to build and train a custom model um, using your own data that you provide. Um, and you're going to need to build the model architecture yourself. We've got a couple of different tools to help you do this. Um, TensorFlow for helping you build your models, and Machine Learning Engine to train and serve your models on Google Cloud Platform. And I want to give you a brief intro uh, to each of these. So TensorFlow is an open source project created by the Google Brain team. Um, so they wanted everyone in the industry to be able to benefit from all of the machine learning projects they were working on. So they made TensorFlow an open source project on GitHub. Uh, and the uptake has been phenomenal. TensorFlow is the most popular machine learning project on GitHub. Last time I checked, I think it had over 85,000 GitHub stars. And you can run your TensorFlow training and serve your TensorFlow models anywhere. Um, you don't need to do it on Google Cloud Platform. Um, so you can run training on your own servers, in your own data centers. You can run it on VMs and other cloud providers. Um, and you can even compile your TensorFlow models down to ARM code if you want to run them on a mobile device. So I want to talk a little bit about how the TensorFlow, what the TensorFlow API looks like. At the bottom level here, we have the op kernels. Um, so CPU, GPU, or on a mobile device. Um, on top of that, we have the TensorFlow distributed execution engine to execute these kernels. Um, and what most developers deal with is the API front end. And what I'm going to focus on today is the Python front end. Um, and depending on how much control you want to have in your model architecture, you can use um, the low-level TensorFlow APIs to build your model from scratch. Um, layers is a utility TensorFlow offers um, to help you configure each of the layers in your neural network. But on top of this, um, we have a couple of higher-level APIs. Um, one of these is called the Estimator API. And this basically streamlines the process of training, evaluating, generating predictions, um, and creating a way to export your model to then serve it. It makes this whole process really easy for you once you instantiate an estimator um, you automatically have access to um, this entire training loop. Keras is another higher level API. Um, it's got a really nice, easy to use syntax to help you um, build each layer in your model. And then on top of this, we have what we call pre-built estimators. Um, these are essentially models in a box. So you can just instantiate one. You just need to know what type of model you need to use, um, and you're ready to go. So you get all the benefits of estimators, um, but a lot of the, the underlying plumbing and the model architecture is handled by TensorFlow for you. Um, so all you need to do is pre-process your data, um, declare the way that you're going to feed it into your model, and then handle generating predictions and serving your model. Um, and in the demo in a bit, I'm going to highlight um, a demo I built using pre-built estimators. So once you've built your TensorFlow model, you're going to need to think about how you're going to run training for it, um, and how you're going to serve it in production. So if, you're, if your application goes viral, you need a way to handle lots and lots of prediction requests. Um, and one reason that we've only seen uh, machine learning catch on fairly recently is that training a model is a very, very computationally expensive job. Um, and so only recently we've, had, we've seen advances in hardware um, that is making this possible. So we need a way to train and serve our model. 
And I'm going to show you uh, how to do this on a cloud machine learning engine. As I mentioned before, you can, you can train your TensorFlow model anywhere. Uh, you don't have to do it on Google Cloud. Uh, because I'm on the cloud team, I'll talk about Cloud ML Engine. Um, so what is it? It's a fully managed platform for TensorFlow. Let's you run distributed chain training using GPUs um, or TPUs, which are currently in alpha. And then once your model is trained, you can deploy it on Machine Learning Engine for serving. And then you get access to um, an easy to use API to then generate predictions on your trained model. So the way that you use ML Engine, you prepare your TensorFlow code locally, and then you put all of your training data and test data in Google Cloud Storage. And then you start your training job using um, the gcloud command. I mentioned that's our command line interface for um, using many different Google Cloud products. So you can kick off your training and evaluation jobs there. Um, and then you can check out the logs on Cloud Console. Um, so Lloyd alluded to this demo briefly, uh, but I wanted to build something that combined TensorFlow with ML, ML Engine um, and give you a brief overview of what that was. So I built a Taylor Swift detector, kind of silly, but I wanted to build um, an end-to-end -end demo that showed building a model and then how you can then serve it and generate predictions on a mobile app. Um, I know a little bit of Swift, so I knew I wanted to build a Swift app that queried my model, so then I thought, what else should I build but a Taylor Swift detector, because it'd be kind of fun. Um, so this is a little GIF of what the app looks like. And the way that I built it was I used the TensorFlow Object Detection API um, to build the object recognition model. That is a, a library built on top of TensorFlow specifically for doing object detection in images. Um, object detection just means returning the bounding box of where you find an object in your image. Um, and then I use Machine Learning Engine to train the model, serve it, and then generate predictions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each piece of the app. Um, so first, the TensorFlow Object Detection API um, lets you do something like this. Find objects in an image. Um, it'll return how confident it is that it found that object correctly, and it gives you the bounding box of where that is in an image. Um, one example is, let's say you wanted to build a pet detector um, that detected different breeds of pets and identified where they were in the image. Now to do this, um, it utilizes a technique called transfer learning. So if I were to have built this from scratch um, using my own training data, I would have probably had to have thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of labeled images of Taylor Swift. Probably not the best use of my time labeling all of those images. I actually only needed to use um, 200. Um, the reason I was able to just use um, a little bit of training data was because I used this technique called transfer learning. So now how this works is we take a model that has been trained on a similar classification task. So in this case, our model, I used a model called MobileNet, which is optimized for mobile, um, which is trained to do object recognition, to identify different objects in an image. And with transfer learning, we remove the last couple of layers from that model, and then we retrain it on our own data using what it has already learned. Um, if I were to do this from scratch, my model would have had to start out learning not only how to recognize Taylor Swift, but how to re just recognize objects in an image in general. Um, but here I was able to utilize um, a pre-trained model that's been trained on millions of images to do that already. So here's how it all fits together. Lots of different product icons here, but I'll give you a brief overview. Um, so I use TensorFlow Object Detection to build the model. I put my training data in Google Cloud Storage, ran the training job on Machine Learning Engine, um, and then I also used ML Engine to serve the model. So I deployed it to ML Engine for serving. Um, and then my iOS client was written in Swift. And it's a relatively thin client. All it's doing is it's uploading the images. And I'm using a couple of different Firebase products here. Um, I'm uploading the images to Cloud Storage for Firebase. And then I have a function that's triggered. Um, this function is written in Node.js. This is going to um, Base64 encode the image and then send it to the ML Engine API for generating a prediction. So the prediction response will be a bounding box and a confidence value, um, which I write to Cloud Storage and Cloud Firestore, which is a database. And in my, also in my function, I'm going to draw a box around where she is in the image. So that's what the app looks like. I have a link to it again on the, on the last slide. Um, so moving along to the last step in, in zero to ML, what if we have a custom task and enough training data to build and train a model from scratch? Um, just to recap, you're going to need a couple of different resources to do this type of task. And I want to show you an example of a classification model I built um, to predict voting trends. So just some quick background. There's about 3,000 counties in the US. 
And I wanted to see if I could use demographic data um, to predict which way a, a county will vote. I got the data um, in Kaggle, um, which is a data analysis tool. It's got tons of different data sets. I definitely recommend checking it out if you're new to machine learning and want to find some interesting data sets to work with. So I got the data from Kaggle. And the original data set included a ton of different uh, demographic data points. Um, these in my model are called features, and then the output is going to be the label or the prediction. Um, so I put the data in BigQuery. BigQuery is our big data warehouse tool on Google Cloud Platform. And I wanted to get just a couple of different um, pieces of data as my features. I didn't want to use all of the ones provided in the data set. So I just, predict, I, I just grabbed the few that you see here, um, and then this is going to be my label. So there's a couple of different ways I could solve this problem. Um, I could solve this as a regression problem. If it was a regression problem, my output would be a numerical value. So for example, my output would be the percentage of each county that voted for Clinton. I could also solve this as a classification problem. And in that case, my model would output um, one of two classes. Did the majority of the county vote for Clinton or Trump? So these would be integers, zero or one, corresponding with both of my labels. So I decided to solve this as a uh, linear classification problem. So I just needed to do a, a bit of pre-processing on my data to take um, the values provided in the data set um, and instead output a classification, which is going to correspond with one of the candidates. So the first step was writing a, a simple Python script to pre-process my input data. This is not part of my model, but I basically just took um, the percentage from the last row of my CSV file, and I converted it to a binary class, zero for Trump or one for Clinton. And then I wrote this to a new CSV. Um, and what TensorFlow needs to read this data into my model is what one thing, it, the first thing it needs is what's called feature columns. And this is going to tell TensorFlow um, the structure of the data that I'm feeding into my model. So these are the different features um, that I'm using here. And these are all numerical columns. Um, so these, these are all, all the values are floats. Um, so it's pretty easy to create my array of feature columns here. If instead I had um, a different type of feature column, like I could have had maybe categorical data, um, then I would have just declared a different type of feature column here. So the next thing we need, what you'll notice here is that um, we still haven't connected our actual data anywhere. So what we need to do that is called an input function. And I know there's a lot of code on this slide, but I'll walk through it briefly. Um, so our input function basically tells TensorFlow um, how to read in the data into our model uh, from those feature columns. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm reading the CSV data. And this tensorflow.decodeCSV function lets me do that. This just tells it um, the format or, of each value in my data. So they're all floats. Um, the, last row, the last column of my CSV is the label. The rest are the features in my model. And so then I just return a dictionary of features and labels. Um, and here, what I'm doing is I'm using a new API that's part of TensorFlow called Dataset. Um, and this is a new, more performant way to read data into my model. One way to do this is with a text line data set. Um, so I'm calling decode CSV on each line in my, in my file. You always want to shuffle your data, especially for training, because um, the original data set was in alphabetical order by county. So we want to make sure we shuffle it. Um, repeat will tell TensorFlow how many iterations to go through our entire data set. Um, so every time it goes through our entire data set, it's going to adjust the weights of the model um, and then start training again. So I tell it how many times I want it to do that. And then batch tells it how many elements to process at once, how many elements in my data set it's going to process at once. Um, and then this iterator function is what turns our data set into tensors, um, which is what TensorFlow needs to build the model. Tensors are just multidimensional arrays. And then we return our features and labels. So then to create our model, um, all we need to do to uh, instantiate it is just this line of code here. Um, I'm using a linear classifier, because I'm solving this as a classification problem, and then I just pass it my feature columns. Now, if I wanted to completely change the type of model I was using, and let's say solve this as a regression problem, all I would need to do um, is switch out the type of model I'm using here. And then now that I have uh, my estimator, all I need to do is call .train to run training. I tell it how many times I want it to go through the entire data set. Um, and then I can get some results to see how accuracy was on my entire data set. I get some output here. Um, so for this particular model, it had 96.5% accuracy, which means that it, um, it predicted 96% uh, of the test examples correctly. And then we just call predict to then generate predictions on new data that the model hasn't seen before. 
Um, our prediction output in the case of a classification problem is gonna be what's called a um, softmax probability. So this will return an array um, with the number of labels we have in our data set. So in this example, we only had two, zero, or one corresponding with our different labels. Um, and the values of this array are always going to add up to one, and they indicate the probability that the example corresponds to one of these labels. So in this case, it's 99% confident that this particular piece of demographic data corresponds to a label of zero. Um, so I've sh shown you this in slides, but I wanted to actually show you uh, how to run this model, running, running the model live, and I'm gonna do that using a Jupyter Notebook. Um, Jupyter is a web-based web tool for running Python code. I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. I know I'm running a bit short on time, so I'll run through this um, quickly. But here I've got, this is all the code for my model, right here, just that. I'm gonna run through each block. Um, so here I'm just importing all the libraries I need. I can ignore that warning. Um, I've got my training and test data in separate CSV files. Here I've got the feature columns, just like you saw on the slide, um, and the input function code here is the same from the slide. I am here going to set up my classifier. So here I instantiate my linear classifier, make that a little bit bigger. Um, and I'm gonna run training for 20 iterations. So I'm gonna kick off a training job. Um, this shouldn't take too long, probably less than a minute. So it's gonna run training here, and when training is done, um, I'll have a model that I can evaluate accuracy on. So here it's logging a bunch of data on each step of the process, and there it goes. Okay, training is complete. Because um, my data set here wasn't too big, this is just a small example to show you how it works. Remember I only had um, roughly 3,000 uh, rows in my, in my data. So now I can test the accuracy of my model. And as you see here, accuracy was 97%, which is, is pretty good for given a small number of training data. Um, and then what I wanna do here is I wanna generate predictions on some raw data. So here I just have three pieces of raw data. Um, these all represent demographic data for each of the counties corresponding with my feature columns. And I've commented out here um, the correct classification for each of these. So I'm going to set that up and then I'm gonna, predict, I'm gonna print out the prediction results. And remember that this is gonna be in the form of softmax probabilities. Um, so to check if our model was correct, um, this one is predicting a class of zero, which would correspond with Trump, and over here we can see that's correct, since only 23% of the county voted for Clinton. This one also predicted a class of zero, and the third data point, it should have predicted a class of one, which it did. Um, so this shows you that even if you don't have a machine learning background, Using the built-in estimators provided by TensorFlow is a great way to get started. Uh, definitely recommend checking that out. So back to the slides. I know I covered a lot of ground in this presentation. Um, so if you remember just three things. First thing, use a pre-trained API to accomplish common machine learning tasks um, like image analysis, natural language processing, or translation. If you wanna build, um, right now, limited to images, an image classification API trained on your own data, use AutoML Vision. Um, and finally, for custom tasks, you can use TensorFlow to build a custom model trained on your own data, and you can train and serve it on Machine Learning Engine. One more thing for you, because what is a presentation without one more thing? Um, AutoML Vision. If you have a use case that you think would be a good fit for AutoML, uh, please come find me after. I'll be around all day, I'll be at the after party. Um, would love to hear what you'd like to do with it, and I can make sure that you get access to it within a couple of weeks. Um, so that's all I've got. Here is a bunch of resources for all the products I covered. Take a picture of this slide. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming. <laughs>